Hello and welcome to this edition of Live and Ticking, which will focus on the topic of recovering after surgery. I'm Fergal McKinney, Head of British Heart Foundation, Northern Ireland. Recovering physically and mentally from heart surgery can be more of a challenge than we expect. After the operation, you may have a couple of days when you're feeling very low. It's normal to feel emotional, tired and uncomfortable after a big operation. But don't be afraid to talk to people around you or your doctor about how you're doing. If you've had heart surgery, you're probably eager to know when you'll feel more like yourself again and when you can get back to your regular routine. Getting back home after a stay in hospital can feel like a relief, but it's also normal to feel worried. Getting back home after a stay in hospital um, uh, can be a relief, but as I say, it's normal. Of course, everyone heads heals at a different rate and you'll want to work closely with your doctor to know what's the best way to recover for you. But in general, you'll do a lot of your healing in the first 68 weeks after your surgery. As you begin getting back into your routine, remember to start with small tasks and take plenty, uh, 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 take plenty of breaks. Don't overdo it. As the weeks pass, you'll make progress and you will gradually be able to do more and more. You can ask questions throughout all of our talks and we'll try to answer as many as possible in the question and answer section. If we don't get around to answering your question, then you can speak to one of our cardiac nurses by visiting our heart helpline uh, on the BHF website. You can also join our Health Unlocked community forum for support. This forum provides a safe space to discuss living with any heart or circulatory diseases. This month, we're also very proud to launch our new campaign, The Greatest Treasure. Our hearts are one of the most precious and scientifically complex part of us, but it's often taken for granted. This campaign is here to help everyone rediscover not only the power and preciousness of their own heart, but most of all, how life-saving research can help save it if it goes wrong. You can watch The Greatest Treasure on our website or the BHF YouTube channel. Finally, before we move on to our speakers, I'd like to ask you a quick poll question. And how would you rate your understanding of recovery after heart surgery? One's little and five is a lot. I'll just give you a little moment to check the boxes. Now, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, BHF Senior Cardiac Nurse, Regina Gibbon. Regina has had experience caring for people who have undergone gone surgery and understands the recovery process from a clinical perspective. She's here today to talk about what to expect when recovering from surgery, both physically and mentally. Regina. So thank you again, Fergal. My name is Regina Giblin. I work for the British Heart Foundation as a senior cardiac nurse. I've been a nurse for 20 years now, having 13 years in the NHS, uh, working in specialised cardiac areas, one of those being um, in, a, in a surgical ward for cardiac patients. So I did pre and post-op care, as well as working in intensive care. So today I'm going to talk about recovery from open heart surgery. If you'd like some information about angiograms, or, or angioplasty or recovery from other cardiac procedures, then please have a look at the BHF website, um, which will cover the other procedures. But today we're going to look at cardiac surgery. So the first, um, my talk today is, is concentrating on the first few hours after surgery, and then the first few weeks, and then as well, talking, giving some helpful hints about recovery when you go home. So having a heart operation can is quite a big ordeal. That's the first thing to say. You may be waiting at home for this operation for quite a while. And when it does happen, it can be quite overwhelming. So when you first go have the operation, afterwards you uh, go into intensive care. As the name suggests, it is an intense environment. When you first wake up, it can be very confusing and you'll feel extremely groggy. There will be an intensive care nurse to look after you and to take care of your every need. They are specially, specially trained in the field and they'll make sure that you're comfortable and you're recovering well after your operation. You will feel achy all over. There will be lots of tubes and wires and once fully awake, the nurse and the doctor will remove the tube that's in your throat that was helping you to breathe during the operation. The anaesthetic drugs that you were given during the operation relax your 
breathing muscles. So that tube needs to remove when you're fully awake. You will have metallic taste and feel quite nauseated and your chest area will feel quite sensitive and be bruised. It'll be difficult to take deep breaths and indeed to cough. The nurse will be asking you to take deep breaths um, to get the tube out, but once the tube's out, they will give you an oxygen mask to breathe. As I said, the environment is a bit strange because there's lots of beeping noises. You'll have continu continuous monitoring to make sure you're stable and the nurse will be looking after you. Once you're fully awake, your family or, or your loved ones can come and visit you. It depends on the, the hospital policy, how many visitors can come and when it's appropriate for them to come. Of course, they can ring after you come out of the operation, um, after you come out of theatre, they can ring and find out how you're doing. But once you're fully awake, you, you know, one, one or two people will be able to come to your bedside. It'll be very emotional for them and for yourself and this is completely normal feelings to have because they wouldn't have, they probably won't see you as vulnerable. This would be a very vulnerable stage that you'll be at. Um, uh, at the time when you're fully awake, you'll be given a patient controlled analgesia. This is a controlled medicine. It's a machine. You press a button and every five minutes it gives you a controlled amount of morphine. It won't overdose you because it's timed out, but you'll be able to press it every five minutes if you have pain. If this medicine isn't, isn't controlling your pain and you have pain, breakthrough pain is what we call it, then please let your nurse know they can increase the medication or give you other medication as well. They will also give you medication for the nausea that you experience if you're on a morphine type medication, uh, med morphine type pain relief. As I mentioned earlier, you'll have a metallic taste. You'll also have a sore throat. You'll be in, you'll be in bed because you'll be very tired and groggy and you'll have a urinary catheter in place to help you with urinating. But the operation is done. No more waiting and the recovery starts now. So day two to day seven, the typical amount of time you spend in hospital after having open heart surgery is between five and seven days which doesn't seem like a lot, but a lot can happen in those two to, two to, to seven days after the operation, you can, you can manage quite a lot. The first day after intensive care, you'll go to high dependency unit. You'll be sitting out of bed, the chest drains and different tubes will be removed. You'll be starting to do more things for yourself. The oxygen mask will be changed to a little nasal specs, which will go um, in your nose. The nurse will help you to sit out of the bed and they'll probably do a wash by the bedside. But if you're feeling up to it, you could also have a shower. You'll still have to be continuously monitored with heart monitor and the pain medication will change from IV medication, intravenously medication to oral tablets. And as I said, if your pain relief is not enough, you can ask for more medicine. Please don't be brave or be a hero. Take the painkillers if you need them. This has been a big operation on your body. You will also see a physiotherapist which will help you with deep breathing. During the operation, the anesthetic makes your um, chest, your chest muscles relax and they come, become a bit lazy. So afterwards, you need to have deep breaths to prevent chest infections. This is hard because your chest is being opened and it's quite bruised and sore. So having a physio help you is very important. They may give you a towel that's wrapped, like rolled up, Basically, you, you hold, hug that in like a teddy bear to take deep breaths. Um, also, they'll be doing some mobility exercises with you as well to strengthen your arms and your legs. You'll be achy all over like you've had the flu. That's what it feels like. Um, and it takes a number of weeks, actually, for the energy levels to come back to normal. So recovery in the ward, your appetite will be won't be there for a while so please eat small and little meals if you don't enjoy the hospital food ask your family to bring in the foods that you do like to eat because we encourage you to eat at this time because you need calories to for wound healing but also just general healing for your body after having this operation there'll be more visitors allowed in the ward at this time so do encourage people to come in to see you um, you'll be doing more walking about up and down the ward with, with the physio, as well as a stair assessment if there's stairs at home. 
If you think you need carers at home when you first go home, please speak to the nurses on the ward. They should be organizing a, an assessment of your social needs as well. Some people, if they live alone, for example, should have friends or family coming and checking in on them and helping them with their recovery at home. But others, if they're a bit older, they may need some carers to come in to help only for a short period. You will have some TED stockings. These are white stockings that you wear and they make sure that um, you don't have any clots in your legs after the operation due to not walking around as much. You should have, a, you should have two pairs, one pair that you wear and one pair that you wash. You just wash them in cold water. On discharge, the nurse will go through your medication. You should be given some new medications. It may take your body some time to get used to them. When you're at home, if you're not sure about your tablets, you can speak to your GP or your pharmacist. There is a new medicine service available on the NHS on the website, but you can speak to the pharmacist directly and ask them to go through your tablets and talk about any side effects that you may be experiencing. Also, the discharge nurse will go through and let you know when your surgical outpatient appointment will be. So recovery at home, a few helpful tips. I haven't really mentioned wound healing, so I'll talk about that first. You will have a wound on your chest from just below your, um, your neck down to just above your, your navel, above your, um, your tummy. And basically, uh, this will be quite a large wound. It takes, it takes a while for that scar to heal. And you, some people have a notch on the top of their chest as well. We call that a sternal notch. And that's just basically where the surgeon pulled the skin really tight. It takes about two to three months for that notch to come down. The scar itself will be red for about two to three weeks after the operation, but then it starts to fade. Once you go home, it's ideal if your chest wound is dry and open to air. So what I mean by that is there's no dressing on it. If there is a dressing on it, it's because the wound is oozing a little bit of fluid. And usually the nurses on the ward will explain how to look after it. They may need to organize a practice nurse or a district nurse to change the dressing at home, but hopefully you go home with a chest wound that's dry. Signs of wound infection would be, it'd be red, it'd be hot to touch, it'd be oozing kind of like um, yellowish fluid, and you would feel like you have a fever. If you have any of those symptoms, please see your GP as soon as possible or ring NHS 111 because you may need antibiotics. Unfortunately, some people do get a wound infection and end up back in hospital with a chest wound infection needing IV antibiotics. So it is a situation that you do need to see a healthcare professional about. As I mentioned earlier, pain relief will be on oral tablets when you go home. Please take them regularly. Most people go home on paracetamol, which they take four to six hourly. I recommend in the first two weeks to take those tablets four to six hourly, even though you're starting to feel a bit better. It's just you need to make sure you get plenty of rest and to carry out your normal daily activities and to get your energy levels back. After about two weeks, you can start to wean off the painkillers. So I would take the ones in the morning, leave out the ones at lunchtime, take the ones in the, in the evening and then the ones at night. And then after a week, you just take the morning and just take the evening and then eventually you just take the evening tablets. It's important to try and get your body into a routine. What I mean by that is go, get up early in the morning, get the same time, sorry, get up at the same time in the morning, go to bed same time at night. This helps your circadian rhythm and basically helps your energy levels to get restored. I also recommend in having little and often meals to get your appetite back and do eat what you like, but we do recommend a Mediterranean diet, lots of fruits and vegetables. It's important to have lots of fruit and vegetables for vitamins and minerals for wound healing and general recovery. More details about the Mediterranean diet are found on our BHF website. Um, with regards to other daily activities, please resume your normal sex life whenever you feel ready. Um, it's like a normal activity. If you feel like you've got the energy to go out walking, then you've got the energy to carry on with your normal sex life. I would say maybe have your partner take a more active role and you have more comfortable position. With regards to walking, once you get home, it does help to start exercise as soon as you feel up to it. We would say start walking every day, first week, five to 10 minutes, at a pace you're able to carry on talking, but a tiny bit shorter breath. 
We want you short of breath to raise your heart rate and that helps your body to helps your heart to, to actually get a little bit fitter, but also it helps your body to heal as well. So the first week, five to 10 minutes of, of walking on the flat. Second week, you do 10 to 15 minutes walking. Third week, you do 15 to 20 and you gradually build that up to 30 minutes walking five times a week. That would be the ideal situation. If you're not able to do any walking for mobility reasons, there is some um, videos we have on our website about doing sit seated exercises. And we will cover cardiac rehabilitation later in the talk uh, when, our, when our researchers talk about cardiac rehabilitation, but I do recommend it. It's a very good program, education and psychological support, as well as physical support with regards to exercise. It does help people to recover after having heart surgery. Emotions, it's normal to feel up and down after having heart surgery. I mentioned earlier, you may feel like you've waited such a long time for this operation and when it finally happens, your emotions can, can, over, can be overwhelming. Please speak to your family and friends about how you're feeling. They're also going through it as well. So please be patient with them. If you find that you're feeling very anxious or you're starting to have feelings of depression, please speak to your GP and they can refer you to some talking therapies. Returning to work is individual, it depends on the person's job. Um, if you have a office work or um, a non-physical job, we'd say at least four weeks off work. If it's a manual job, with lots of heavy lifting, we would say we would recommend waiting to that breast, breastbone to heal, which actually takes about three months. So if you can, take the three months off so that bone is healed. We don't recommend lifting anything between five and 10 kilograms up to three months after the operation. Holidays. You can go in the UK whenever you feel ready, just be careful with heavy bags. And um, if you want to go abroad, again, I would say wait to three months. You'll hopefully have a surgical outpatient appointment. You'll be, your body will be used to the medications by then, and uh, you should feel better about flying. Make sure that your tablets are in the hand luggage and your discharge letters in the hand luggage and get travel insurance. Medication, I mentioned earlier that you can speak to your pharmacist about new medications, but you should have a supply of medications, about two weeks supply when you get discharged home. You can also ring um, our helpline in the BHF, more details to follow in the next slide. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. If I haven't covered any helpful tips about recovery at home, please do ask me in the Q&A section. Support from the BHF. So we do have a heart helpline. The link um, is detailed in my presentation. It'll also be on the chat. Um, there's cardiac nurses available Monday to Friday, nine to five. We don't work bank holidays, but we are there. We can try and answer any of your questions and we can signpost you to information as well. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions later. Thanks, Regina. Uh, I'm sure that's been very helpful for any audience members who are awaiting surgery themselves or friends and family who are supporting someone through the recovery process. Next, I'd like to introduce Stuart Waters, who had a cardiac arrest in March 2022 and went on to have a quintuple bypass surgery. Stuart will talk about his recovery with Yana Theodoro from the research engagement team at the BHF. Over to you, Stuart and Yana. Fabulous. Thank you, Fergal. Thank you, Fergal. And Stuart, welcome. Thank Hi. you so much for being here and sharing your experiences with us. We really appreciate it. No a problem. Wonderful. Um, so why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yeah. yourself and your health prior to March 2022? Yeah, um, my name's Stuart Walters. Um, I'm 49 years old. I'm married to a lovely wife called Leanne, and I've got two lovely kids. Um, very healthy family, sport orientated, kids do swimming and football, and I'm a football coach for my daughter's football team. So it's very a family orientated family, and um, I am an HGV driver. Fabulous. And what happened the day of your cardiac arrest? Because I know you were behind the wheel at the time. Yeah, um, I don't really remember a lot, but from what I do remember is obviously working all day, and then coming home and spending some time with the family and then rushing off the football training. Done the football training with my kids. Uh, everything, I felt fine. And then 
jumped in the car to drive home and then it happens when I was behind the wheel literally as I was driving on the driveway home I um just collapsed without any signs or anything so it was lucky my kids were with me but unlucky they witnessed the situation yeah and and what did they do what how did they respond <clears throat> well obviously from what they told me was my little boy stayed with me um was I obviously undone the seatbelt, trying to shake me. Sorry, I'll get it, but I still... Oh. <clears throat> you okay? Yeah, fine. Um, and then my daughter, when I raised, when I got my wife, and then they obviously got the neighbours, and lucky enough, <clears throat> two of my neighbours are, are care workers, and one of them had just done a CPR retraining. Mm -hmm. So um, they basically, two of them done like the CPR, I mean, so all the uh, ambulance people drove, you know, arrived. Really? So if it, if it wasn't for them, I don't think I'd be here. Yeah, really, really lucky. Thank you so much for showing this, because I know that it's difficult. Um, do you remember what happened after then? Obviously, it must have been a bit of a blur. <coughs> no. Uh, before no, surgery? Or? No, it's, it's, I find out things even today, you know, it's like, not you know over a year ago um and you still will find out things now but from what i i didn't come around till the morning mm -hmm. um and that was only because i just sort of come around and i was angry i was i just you know i didn't you know i was woken up with pipes and mm -hmm. wires everywhere um <clears throat> my wife had loved to just been sent home actually because she'd come in the ambulance and then they sort of told her to go. And then obviously within about 10 minutes, I sort of come around and I was getting really agitated. Mm -hmm. So my wife come back to settle me down. And then I can remember, well, I don't remember saying this. But what she told me was, all I said was something's happened to my heart because there was like um, heart pictures around the, the room, you know. So um, I obviously assumed something had happened, but not obviously to the extent of what it actually was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was seeing probably a lot of confusion then when you woke up. Yeah, with yeah. those. Yeah, because I, and stuff. I, yeah, yeah, because I never felt ill. I didn't yeah. feel. I felt normal mm -hmm. as, as as I normally do. You know, so you know, you think, well, why has it happened to me? Because I didn't feel ill. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't have any chest pains or anything like that. It was just a like what I class as a light switch moment to me. It was just like somebody just flipped the switch off. Yeah. And then what, what happened next? So what was your journey to say? Uh, uh, well, um, the journey from there was literally, obviously, being monitored in Pembury Hospital. Um, my wife was coming in every day, um, and it was, it was a way plan, just a waiting game for a bed up in Kings. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> they was going to air ambulance me on the night of the incident, um, but for some other known reason... I think I was too unstable because, like I said to you before, they tried to put me into an induced coma. Yeah. But my body was fighting or, or for whatever reason, they decided to take me to the, the nearest hospital, which was only two minutes down the road, which was obviously mm -hmm. a big benefit as well. Um, so it was just a point of uh, get, waiting to get a bed up in King's Hospital to have the surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the meantime, it was being monitored doing MRI scans, echograms, and things like that. So basically, they was doing all the tests in the local hospital. So when I went up to London, they had all the information. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, literally. So it's about two and a half weeks before I actually got up to London after the incident. And then what, the surgery all went well. Or what happened during the surgery? Because um, yeah, you obviously, more bypasses yeah, we, than you were yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we got we went up we we went up there on a Saturday, and I saw the the surgeon come around to the surgeon and his team come around to see me. Sort of explained, right? We think it's a triple heart bypass, but obviously we don't know until obviously we it operate on you. Um, and then they said obviously about the aortic valve um, that. They would try and repair it if possible. And they give me the options of like a mechanical valve. But obviously that comes with the medication side of it, taking tablets for the rest of your life or 
going down the natural valve route. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you'd be having that done sort of every eight to 10 years. So I had sort of obviously agreed to what I wanted to have done. So I agreed to go with the uh, mechanical valve. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it was just playing a waiting game, saw the surgeons, decided what we had to do, and then just waited for a couple of days for the operation to happen. Yeah, and, and how did you feel when you woke up? Uh, fine, uh, but obviously I found out obviously after as well, a, a six and a half hour operation then up turning to 13 hours because it turned out that my, my valve had actually ruptured mm -hmm. and I had to have a new aorta root as well as like five by bypasses in the end. So I felt better than what I thought I would be, but you know, so, but I didn't, I didn't come around till the following morning. Okay. Yeah. And so you had a good like bit of rest. Tubes and why coming around with like tubes and why is that out coming out of you? Um, but I managed to get up, had a bit of breakfast. And then I was shocked when they sort of said, right, we need to get you up and sort of like walking. But yeah. I've done it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so it all, went, it all went well. Yeah, you don't expect that, do you? Getting up and no. walking around no. the day no. after having heart surgery. Yeah, now when people said that before, I, I was thinking, no, no, honestly, I'm not, no, I'm not believing that for one minute, but it obviously helps. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and how long was your stay in hospital after the, after the operation? Uh, it was about three about just, over, just under three months in the end mm -hmm. just purely because um after the operation i um obviously because i had to go on warfarin tablets yeah i couldn't get i couldn't get booked into my clinic locally to have my blood tested so they just said right i'm staying out staying over the weekend and then we'll get you home on a monday so it could have been like literally a four or five four or five day turnaround from mm -hmm. operation to getting home but in the meantime i ended up catching an infection and ended up catching pneumonia right. so which obviously slowed the process down mm -hmm. um and then i ended up catching um covid as well so right. yeah so yeah the cars were dealt against me at that time but yeah. um it sort of prolonged me like getting the um because i ended up having an icd unit put in as well Oh yeah, how long? How long was it after your that, that, was, surgery that, you that was about four weeks, right? Purely because obviously contracting pneumonia and COVID that they couldn't do the operation because obviously you know being clean and things like yeah. that. Yeah. So um, yeah. Right, and then so after this quite long period in in hospital, how did it feel then going home? Shock. It was. It was a, a nice shock, but a scary one at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really, I didn't realise how scary it was until I actually got home yeah. and sort of um, got in because, you know, I'm used to like being at the button, like pressing for a nurse, any issues, you know, your tablets were there or if you was uncomfortable, you know, and it was going from having everything to having nothing really. Yeah. Um, but it was lovely to see the family who was supportive so um yeah I'm sure they were so happy to have you back yeah very yeah and who was supporting you at home uh, my wife um was all the time like she has every day mm -hmm. um she was like she got some time off work um so she was traveling up to London every day to be by my side um but obviously getting when we got home my wife had probably another month off to look after me and my kids were sort of by my side, sort of every movement, they'll be there in, you know, daddy, this, do you want this? You know, so it, it was lovely. Mm -hmm. It's like, it was nice being spoiled, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I had to start doing things because yeah. I had to, you know, I had to get myself back to normality. Yeah. And, and when did you start cardiac rehab, rehab, sorry. And how did you uh, find yeah, it was about, it was probably about six, about six weeks after I got home. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just purely because I just missed um, a cardio class. 
So I had to wait for that one, that session to finish, which was about another four weeks. Um, so I had the cardiac team come out and assess me where I was at. Um, they was happy from day one when they saw me. They was like, well, we can see you're more advanced than where you should be, really, because all, all I was That's doing good. was walking. Yeah. Like, like Regina was saying about the walking, I just sort of got quite obsessed with it. Just just constantly doing it obviously not putting yourself at risk because you've got to really you've got to understand your body um so yeah so it's just walking every day and then yeah once i've got that time back then um went to the class which was really interesting yeah. got to know got to understand my body a lot more and obviously you had nurses there to tell you to perhaps slow down you know because just wanted to get there and get do it going again, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, but benefit from it so much, so so much. That's brilliant. That's great to hear. And just finally, like, how do you feel? It's a big question. How do you feel like, or do you feel like your perspective on life has changed after this experience? Yeah, one hundred percent. I thought I was fairly easy going beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, but now, yeah, I look like, you know, you know it's a, a completely different person. My wife said that. Um, yeah, I'll just try and be a lot easier in life. Just just take every day as it comes now, but enjoy life because, you know, I've been given a second chance. So, yeah, make every moment count and just, you know, love all the family and that. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Stuart. We really, really That's appreciate great. it. Thank you. Um, very much. It must be difficult to talk about, but thank you so much. It's okay. Thank, no, thank, thanks for your time. Thank you. Well, well Fergal, back to you. All of our contributors, but um, I think we particularly value patients who share their health story and vulnerability. And the way that you did that so openly and honestly today, we're really grateful for. So thank you. And thank you to Yana. But finally, we're joined by BHF funded researchers, Professor Sally Singh and research fellow Hannah Waterhouse. It's over to you guys. So as we've already been introduced, we are going to talk about cardiac rehabilitation today. Um, I'm going to generally give an overview of cardiac rehabilitation. It's already been mentioned a couple of times by uh, Stuart and Regina. So I'm just going to uh, close that loop. And then Hannah's going to talk about the project that we were uh, very uh, kindly funded by the British Heart Foundation to complete, which is a little bit different to perhaps some of you sitting on this call today, but nevertheless, actually, it still involves cardiac rehabilitation. So we're both from the University of Leicester. The funds were uh, managed there. I'm a professor of pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation. And my research interests are particularly around alternative models of delivery of, of rehabilitation. That's for patients with respiratory and cardiac disease, or indeed a combination of both. Um, and my most recent um, projects have been involved looking at rehabilitation for people with multiple long-term conditions. So many of you have got cardiac disease, but you may also have another disease as well. For example, you know, arthritis of the knee or the back, etc. So very often people are living with more than one condition. And we've also been working in low and middle income countries to try and develop rehabilitation there. And Hannah, as you've already heard, was a PhD fellow that was funded by the British Heart Foundation um, and is also a senior lecturer in the School of Nursing at the University of Leicester. And, and Hannah will very quickly follow on from me and describe her research to you. So I'm just going to go through what cardiac rehabilitation is. And I, I would hope that a, a number of you that, that have had a cardiac event have actually been through cardiac rehab. So um, hopefully this will be a refresher for some of you and talk through some of, some of the benefits. But importantly, it's a personally tailored program of exercise and usually education sessions. And it's designed to help you recover but also support your relatives or carers on that journey and we've already heard today 
uh, that it is a, a physical and a, a mental recovery, isn't it? It isn't just getting over the insult of the sort of surgery. So cardiac rehabilitation has a number of core components that you can see on this diagram, but importantly, it starts with an initial assessment. So when you attend for your cardiac rehabilitation program, it should be a one-to-one -one session where whoever is, is managing that, and they will always be trained people in, in cardiac rehabilitation and cardiovascular disease, but they have the skills and knowledge to assess you know, where you are, how your physical and mental recovery is going, look to look at your levels of anxiety and um, blood pressure, weight, how physically fit you are, so that this programme can absolutely be tailored very specifically to your needs. So in terms of how cardiac rehabilitation should help you, it's a, it's a highly evidence-based intervention. So as researchers, and clinicians, we're very confident when we refer people to rehabilitation that it will be of benefit to you in, in all of the measures that we as researchers are very comfortable with. And some of those may not mean a lot to you as a participant, but they're really important that we can show the benefits of rehabilitation. But, but on a very personal level, they absolutely help you to understand your condition. They help you recover from your surgery or your procedure or, or if you've had a heart attack. And importantly, it helps identify where perhaps changes can be made to improve your cardiovascular health um, in terms of your lifestyle. And I suspect many of you are, you know, you don't need, need me to tell you that smoking is a, a massive risk factor for diet being anxious um, and actually being physically inactive. So a cardiac rehabilitation program will focus on these areas that, that we can change, we, you know, or not we, you can change and, and, and the team will actually support you. If you're able to make those positive lifestyle changes, then inevitably that reduces your risk of, of, of further heart problems. And actually, we've heard very eloquently from Stuart about some of the psychological impacts of living with a with a heart condition. And it can help support people and their family and um, come to terms with that as well. So there are different models of, of rehabilitation. And you may have all been exposed to different different opportunities. The traditional method is a centre based programme. Um, often located in a hospital or in a leisure centre, it doesn't have to be in a hospital at all, where you're supervised by trained staff. But there's also uh, alternative opportunities because not everybody can make it to a centre or the times may not be convenient or in fact you actually don't want to exercise in a group. So there are other opportunities. It may be simply following a workbook like the Heart Manual and that would be with telephone support. Or increasingly, as we've seen in COVID, there's been sort of technology based solutions and they may involve video conferencing where you, uh, as part of a, a group or, or join through a Zoom call like this. Or it could be um, something you do independently, but with some remote support through a website, for example, where there is a telephone facility or an Ask the Expert facility. Or increasingly, we're seeing on the market a number of um, smartphone applications that you independently work through where you get very little support but of course the important thing is to match you with the mode of delivery and, and there should be an informed choice around that. So from a sort of health economics and mortality point of view we know that exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation reduces overall um, and cardiovascular mortality as well as hospital admission rates and that's important to you as, as individuals and of course that's really important to the health service it, it's very keen to keep people out of hospital um, it's not a place where anybody wants to go particularly and we know that the home and the centre-based programs seem to be pretty equivalent in terms of their clinical outcomes how they affect your overall life. And um, they seem to be effective in people with a range of cardiovascular problems. So after you've had a heart attack, after you've had a, a revascularization procedure, so you know something like surgery, or for people 
with heart failure. And this is something we're going to get onto in, in a moment with Hannah's project. So who is cardiac rehab for? And this is the sort of range of, of people that we would definitely anticipate seeing through a rehabilitation programme and almost um, you know, mandated to come to rehabilitation. It, it's largely a model of opting out rather than opting in. And that's really important for you as individuals to understand that you should have routinely been offered this at the time of your uh, intervention or heart attack. So there are some other times when people are referred in for cardiac rehabilitation. So that may, may be people who have angina and we're accumulating evidence all the time to establish how useful that is. And there is very strong evidence for people with heart failure um, to be offered a rehabilitation program. So on that note, uh, whilst we land on heart failure, I'm get now going to pass over to Hannah, who's going to talk through her PhD project. Great, thank you, Sally. I'll tell you when you, uh, it, I've just got one slide, so if you can move on. This is just what I'm going to talk about. So I'm talking about cardiac rehabilitation and um, specifically around heart failure and exploring what matters uh, from various perspectives. So here we go. Um, as you can see, over 900,000 people are actually living with heart failure currently in the UK. And heart failure, people who I talk to, they say when they're first diagnosed, they're actually frightened by this term. They feel that actually it means that their heart is failing and it's not going to work. But of course, the heart is still working. It's pumping blood around the lungs and the body, and it's just not doing the job as well as it should do. So what can we do about it? We do have all sorts of treatments that help treat um, heart failure and improve the functioning of the heart. We've got a fab four drugs um, that are used, but also we have devices that help the heart beat and pump better. And all these things are great and they improve the lives of people with heart failure and help people to live longer and better lives. But as you've heard from Sally, we know that cardiac rehabilitation is good good for people with heart failure. It improves their quality of life and it gets moving better. But we find that people are just not taking it up. People with heart failure do not tend to take up cardiac rehabilitation. And my research was using a mixed method approach and looking into the reasons why. So initially we thought that frailty might have an impact. As you can see, frailty is quite common in people with heart failure. Um, so we did an observational study and we followed 50 people being discharged from hospital with a diagnosis of heart failure. But the study didn't show a link at all. Frail or not, people were no less likely to take up cardiac rehabilitation. So there didn't seem to be a link. However, when we looked at an audit of patients in hospital who'd been admitted into hospital because of their heart failure, we found firstly that about 46% of those patients weren't actually eligible for cardiac rehabilitation at the point of discharge from hospital, but also there was a link between frailty and not actually being suitable for a cardiac rehabilitation program. So this link with frailty was sort of developing that actually Frailty perhaps is actually a reason why people aren't suitable for the current cardiac rehabilitation that's available. I also wanted to find out what people thought. So I used surveys and I used a focus group and interviews and I spoke to nurses and doctors and people living with heart failure. And this is what they told me. Unless they'd done it before, people didn't understand what cardiac rehabilitation was. They were worried about the exercise. Um, and whether they would cope with it. They thought that cardiac rehabilitation was actually optional rather than part of their treatment and the management of their heart failure. But there was a difference between people who were newly diagnosed and those who'd been living with their condition for some time. So those who were newly diagnosed were scared to exercise and felt a lot of uncertainty um, about the future. If they'd had it for some time, they'd actually adapted their lives and they'd learned to live with it and man were managing to cope. Those newly diagnosed were wanting information about their condition 
and how to get help about how to live with heart failure. Those who'd been living with it for some time, particularly if they'd seen no progress, felt that they needed something to change. And the newly diagnosed wanted or were hoping to get back to normal as much as they could. Whereas those who'd been living with their condition for some time were probably looking for smaller gains and smaller ambitions, more looking around meeting up with friends rather than running the London Marathon. So where do we go from here in terms of research? Um, we need to make cardiac rehabilitation important and relevant to people who have heart failure. But we also need to give the right information to the right people. So newly diagnosed people and people who've lived with heart failure for some time, they are two different groups and they have different needs. So our next step is around developing an intervention to help give information to people about cardiac rehabilitation and actually making it specific for the newly diagnosed or those who've been living with it for some time and enabling them to understand the benefits that they may get from it. But also importantly, we mustn't forget those people with frailty, the ones that cardiac rehab didn't suit. And we also need to find ways um, to help them to get moving and find new ways to help with their physical um, improvement and their quality of life too. And that's it. We can move on to the next slide, which is a thank you. Thank you, uh, Sally and Hannah. And we'll welcome back uh, Regina and Stuart now for the question and answer session. Um, so we don't have a lot of time. We have a fair amount of questions. Uh, I'm going to take them in order so that might reflect um, who they're directed to. Um, so first one, do you have any tips on how to recover from subcutaneous ICD surgery? Maybe Regina, could you touch on that? So uh, subcutaneous ICD is actually a cardiac procedure. Um, the recovery it depends on from person to person, but um, usually it's a it's a it can be a day case procedure or it can be overnight. Um, it it doesn't require the same amount of recovery period as open heart surgery would. Um, two to six weeks, I would say. Uh, we'd have more information on on the recovery of cardiac procedures on our website. Um, so have a little look. Um, but um, it, as it's um, not, it, it's, I was going to say non-invasive, it is, it is a bit invasive, but not, it's not open heart surgery. It's just subcutaneous meaning it goes under the skin. So this is an ICD is a, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. And it's for people who've got um, deadly arrhythmias. Uh, so they need, they need this defibrillator in place in case they have any arrhythmias that are dangerous um, to, to their life. Uh, so it's quite an important uh, procedure, but um, I would say that two to two to six weeks would be the recovery period for that. And take pain, pain take the painkillers. <laughs> Thank you very much, Regina. Uh, Stuart, this one is for you. What was your support system like after the surgery? Uh, as in, as in with the family, or as in well, I think just in general, that it probably yeah, health service. I think in, is yeah, probably... sure. Um, well, obviously with the rehab classes and I, I got a lot of support from them by coming to the house and explaining a lot a lot of things um and assessing me getting back to my fitness um and then obviously being given a lot of information to outside classes to continue the rehab work which is what I which I took up and then you know lots of booklets and phone numbers to call on um, and numbers for like counselling as well which I uh, took up as well because so I think you need to talk about these things to help out mentally more than physically as well because you know I think me personally I went through more of the physical side than my family done the mental side of it so um, you know I needed to speak to somebody outside and I spoke to some counsellors which has helped a hell of a lot. Okay, Stuart, thank you. This one's for you again, Regina. Stuart needed surgery following a cardiac arrest, but is recovery quicker if you survive a cardiac arrest than a heart attack, especially if there's no obvious underlying cause? He goes on to say, or she goes on to say, I know people have had a cardiac arrest, but told they were lucky and not needed any other treatment and seem reasonably well. So it depends. Um, 
That's a quite hard uh, question to ask. Some people do have underlying reasons why they have a cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest usually occurs because of a heart rhythm problem. Um, and there may be a heart rhythm problem due to an inherited cardiac condition. So they would need further treatment and further assessment and diagnosis. Um, uh, so cardiac arrests occur for different reasons. It could be a drug overdose. There's lots of different reasons why cardiac arrests happen. So um, very rarely they happen out of the blue. There's usually a reason. So what I would say is um, the people you've met that have had a cardiac arrest and recovered and didn't need any further, maybe they didn't need any further you know, procedures for the guards or arteries because cardiac attack, sorry, heart attack is when you've got a circulatory blood supply problem, which meant that, you know, they've got a blockage of one of their arteries. So that requires um, treatment either with medication or with stenting, which an angioplasty or indeed the open heart surgery. So they do require more, more um, input, but um, a cardiac arrest doesn't normally it rarely occurs just out of the blue. Um, normally there is a reason, and I would say there is normally like follow-up and there's appointments. So yeah, it depends on the person basically. Okay. Well, another one for you, Stuart. Uh, this uh, question says you're an inspiration sharing your story. I agree, and thank you so much. But I wondered how was your pain following surgery? How was it managed inside and outside of hospital? Um, well, <laughs> Obviously, being on top of the tablets, um, but resting, like Regina was saying before, and just getting your body into a, a certain rhythm, um, daily routine. Sort of don't. I, I basically, like Regina was saying before, I was getting up at a certain time, breakfast, and then I'd be like going for a little walk. It, it become a, a daily routine, and that is what I needed to stick to um yeah it was it was very uh emotional and you know physically you know it was it was very tiring um to see me going through the physical side of it but seeing your family go through the emotion you know the mental side of it which was probably a lot harder work than what i thought it was going to be um but i kept the physical side up by just keep walking rehab and now I just go, I, you know, I go to the gym as a normal person now. Um, so, yeah, just got to keep going. Another question I wants to know, Stuart, did you have to make any adjustments to the house? For example, the bedroom downstairs? Is that something? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't want to do that. Um, I, I had obviously got stairs for upstairs. I wanted to use that as to keep my fitness because that is what I had to do in hospital. You know, I, I had to walk up and down the walls every day for your five minutes and then doing the, the stair challenge. So I wanted to keep being physical and active. So we decided to leave the bedroom upstairs. Um, so no, I didn't do any, any changes at all in the house. Good, thank you. Uh, maybe one for Sally or Hannah. In, uh, Michael says in his cardio rehab, which was seven years ago, well-being and mental recovery played a limited role in his view. Is that typical, he wonders? It's not typical in Leicester, but I can... <laughs> <laughs> and it shouldn't be typical anywhere else because clearly we've heard yeah, very you would have thought, today yeah, yeah, that, yeah. you know, that, that your mental recovery is as important as your physical recovery because if mentally you're not well, you won't be able to engage in the physical yeah. recovery. So it's absolutely critical. And I, I'm slightly surprised in some ways that, that that was the impression of that particular cardiac rehabilitation program. When we go to cardiac rehabilitation conferences and it's discussed, it, it's always multifactorial, you know, what you're trying to support people to manage, um, you know, including diet, smoking cessation. So it should really be a very multidisciplinary, multifaceted program. OK, um, another question on the rehab piece, who would not be suitable for rehab? So in terms of cardiac rehab, there are a few acute cardiac diagnoses that would exclude people. Um, so if you had unstable angina, for example, then people would be concerned about exercising you, but you'd be also concerned about exercising as well. 
So apart from the sort of significant cardiac, uh, acute cardiac disease, there are very few contraindications to rehabilitation and there are very few contraindications to exercise, full stop. I think in terms of the research I was doing, which was specifically looking at people with heart failure, then sometimes um, it's not that cardiac rehabilitation per se is an exclusion criteria, but the logistics of trying to deliver a cardiac rehabilitation program to somebody who is very physically dependent um, means that we need to find different ways of actually helping those people become more physically active. I think there's also something that the people in my research study noticed is that they felt that cardiac rehab was purely exercise based. I was looking at exercise based cardiac rehab, which includes the educational perspective. Um, and even if somebody couldn't physically do something because of a cardiac condition that limited them, um, perhaps temporarily, they could still engage in the the wellness and the educational perspective, but often people perceive them purely as an educational, uh, uh, as an exercise um, program rather than the broader term. Okay, thank you. Uh, one for you, Regina, um, and it looks to with materials and BHF. Have, have we any psychological help tools on BHF as, or as part of cardiac rehab? And they refer to the fact that one to one counselling isn't available for 18 months or four to six months for cardiac group counselling. We have our um, heart helpline and uh, people can give us a call um, if they want to talk about how they're feeling after the heart operation um, and we can signpost them onto other charitable organisations for, for counselling as well. Um, and we have some articles about psychological help but and that would be that would be all we have from BHF point of view. Okay. All right. Well, listen, thank you guys very much indeed. From top to bottom, Hannah, this is the way you're on my screen. Uh, Sally, uh, Stuart, uh, again, and Regina, thank you all very much indeed. And to the team for helping organising. And thank you at home for watching this edition of Live and Ticking. We hope you've enjoyed here from all of our brilliant uh, speakers. Before we wrap up, I'd like to go back to that poll question again. And how would you rate your understanding now of recovery? after heart surgery one for very little five a lot and i'll give you just a second again to uh, to reflect on that so if we haven't managed to answer your question today then we encourage you to visit our heart helpline where you can contact our dedicated clinical team as regina has been saying all our incredible research is funded 100% by you, the public. If you've been inspired by the amazing science you've heard today, then all donations to support our life-saving work are very much appreciated. And there's a link to donate should you wish to do so at the end of the event. Our Live and Ticking series are monthly and we strive to produce the best events possible. Your feedback and comments are crucial to help plan and develop future events. So we ask if you can complete the survey at the end of this event or through an email you'll receive in the coming days. This live and ticking event was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel from next week. And our next event will take place on the 28th of June and it'll be on personalised medicine. Thank you again for joining and goodbye.